We'll begin just very shortly with the live stream. Are we beginning now, Dale? We are beginning live now. <laughs> well, welcome everybody to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. <clears throat> I wasn't expecting that. I'm Father Jason Lewis with the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, of course, and our beloved Father Chris Alar, my provincial superior, very good friend, co-author with me with a book after suicide. We co-authored a book together invited me to come and present on Medjugorje today, a topic that is very near and dear to my own heart personally. Father Chris is in New York City right now and will be celebrating Mass at 2 o'clock. So if you leave now, you still have time to get there. <laughs> he gives us his blessing. He gives us his well wishes. We want to pray for him as well. Thank you, all Marian helpers. Welcome to you. Welcome, Marian helpers, all you who love our Blessed Mother, and Jesus, the divine mercy, welcome. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the incredible gift <clears throat> of your mother. She who is the masterpiece of mercy. She who is the queen and mother of the divine mercy. We ask for her intercession in this talk and in the hour that follows to make reparation to her immaculate heart. And pray a prayer that I'm gonna pray that was composed by St. John Paul II on December 8th, the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception in 2003, a prayer that he composed for world peace. And brothers and sisters, I don't have to tell you, we are in dire need of world peace right now in our day. John Paul II, let us in prayer. Queen of peace, pray for us. Mother of mercy and of hope, obtain for the men and women of the third millennium the precious gift of peace. Peace in hearts and in families, in communities, and among peoples. Mary, Queen of the Divine Mercy and Queen of Peace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> well, brothers and sisters, I've been given the impossible task this day to talk about Medjugorje in 45 to 60 minutes. But I'm encouraged because I just came from my parish in St. Mary's in Plano, Illinois, where Dr. John Bergsma, who is a theologian, a biblical theologian at Franciscan University, covered the whole entire Bible in an hour. <laughs> so if he could cover the Bible in an hour, we could cover Medjugorje in an hour, right? So Medjugorje, what is it? For some, it's a controversial topic. For others, it has been a source of mercy, grace, peace, and conversion. And we want to be fair to all those who are inquiring. And I want to talk about it and lay out. And at first, what I want to address is, can we be Catholics in good standing and have personal faith and belief and give our assent to the phenomenon of Medjugorje? My voice is echoing out here. <laughs> That's the question. Can we be Catholics? and good standing, faithful Catholics, and give our personal assent to the phenomenon that's taking place in Medjugorje. Well, first, let me give just a brief overview and an introduction to what has taken place with the phenomenon of Medjugorje. And this is the only time I'm gonna use this word alleged. So what has been alleged, we know that it's been alleged, so that's already a given, and it gets a little cumbersome to keep saying the alleged apparitions. So I would just refer to them as the apparitions after this. We will talk about, with the apparitions, what criterion we can look at throughout the whole entire talk, whether or not we can give our personal assent. But as the apparitions were purported to start in the phenomenon of Medjugorje, it began on June 24th, 1981, when some children first saw the Blessed Virgin in Medjugorje up on a hill. Now, they were scared off. They were afraid of what took place, and they actually ran. One of the visionaries, Miriana, when one other visionary, Ivanka, said to her, 
It's, it's the gospel on the hill. And she laughed at her like, yeah, sure, it's the gospel. Like she has nothing else better to do except to talk to the two of us. And then others came and they ran off. But that isn't the official anniversary of Medjugorje because they ran off and the next day on June 25th, that is the actual observed date of anniversary of Medjugorje. And that's because the six visionaries, the current six visionaries, who would go on and receive messages and the apparitions from Our Lady afterwards, they were formulated, those were the six that were together. Our Lady would identify herself. Well, the primary message of Medjugorje is conversion, prayer, and peace. Conversion, prayer, and peace. On the first day of the six visionaries on June 25th, 1981, the first words out of Our Lady's mouth were, praise be Jesus. Praise be Jesus. Should be the first words out of all of our mouths, right? Praise be Jesus. The second day she appears, June 26, and the reason why I'm referring to this apparition in particular is because in some ways I believe that as a compendium, this particular day is a summation of what all the other messages of these revelations are. She appears, and this is after, at first when she appears, there's 2,000 to 3,000 people gathered on a hill. It's the, actually the third day of the phenomenon going on. One of the visionaries, Vitska, tells her grandmother of what's going on, and there's a buzz throughout the whole entire town. This is communist Yugoslavia. They were forbidden to gather, but two to 3,000 people gather on a hill anyway, despite the threats of co the communistic authorities. And the mother of Vitska, one of the visionaries, says, we need to test this apparition. So if it's of God, it will continue to persist and stand. If, what, but what we want to do to test it, Vitska, take holy water and throw it on the vision that you're seeing. And if it's of the evil one, he'll have to go. So she did, she obeyed her grandmother, threw holy water on the apparition of Our Lady, and Our Lady smiled and continued to appear. <laughs> Maybe a little wet, but I don't know, she's in a supernatural body, right? So she, she probably wasn't too wet. So what she said, when they asked her why she was there, she first identified herself as the Blessed Virgin Mary and said, I wish to be with you to convert and reconcile the whole world. I wish to be with you to convert and reconcile the whole world. And I believe that that is the core essence of what takes place in the message of Medjugorje. Now on returning Maria, and she's the one who receives the apparition on the 25th of the month, every month, and that message goes out to the world. <clears throat> Maria saw the Blessed Virgin as she was descending Apparition Hill, and she saw Our Lady with tears in her eyes near a cross with rainbow color surrounding her. And Our Lady said, peace, 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 be reconciled. Only peace. Make your peace with God and among yourselves. For that, it is necessary to believe, to pray, to fast, and to go to confession. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but that sounds pretty Catholic to me. <laughs> pray, fast, believe, and go to confession. It also sounds like the angel prayer in many ways, the angel prayer from Fatima. So there's an echo there. In subsequent ap apparitions, Our Lady identifies herself as the Queen of Peace. And that's the title she's known as. In Medjugorje, she is known as the Queen of Peace. Those of you who have gone to Medjugorje will know that there is a profound experience, an experiential phenomenon of peace when one goes there. I've had the benefit of that myself. I've been with Father Don Calloway. I've been with several Marian brothers together. We have gone. Father Don took me the first time that I went. We witnessed the solar miracle on Mount Krusevek together and watched it for 20 to 25 minutes as the sun spun and threw off colors of orange and yellow and actually they were colors that were indescribable. They were otherworldly and it looked like a big Eucharistic host 
placed smack right over top of the sun with a bright ring going all the way around it and the sun spun right and left and pulsated. I had to check it because I just had LASIK's eye surgery. <laughs> and I dropped about 1,500 bones to get these eyes to 2015. So I had to look at the sun briefly and look back and then look into the sun again and look back just to test it because what happens when you look into bright light? You see black spots, right? So I looked in directly to it twice, back to the village where it was darker, turned my head back, no spots whatsoever. We continued to watch it until the sun set for the next 20 to 25 minutes, and it just happened to be at the time of the apparition. But we don't want to be presumptuous, right? There is a distinction between private revelation and public revelation. And we have to know this distinction. It's very, very important. Do you have to believe in private revelation? Do you have to believe in the revelations of Fatima, of Lourdes, of Medjugorje, of Guadalupe, where nine million people were converted to Catholicism? Do you have to believe in any of those? You do not have to believe in a single one, even the approved ones. You do not have to give your personal assent of faith. Now, if the mother of God's coming from heaven, <laughs> it's part of God's divine plan, and it's for a specific time in history to bring a specific message and focus into the gospel, we might want to listen to our mother. <laughs> we might want to listen. Mama might have something to say. So we know we want to do that with Lourdes and with Guadalupe and with Fatima, definitely approved apparition places. But what about Medjugorje? And we'll get to that. First, let's talk about, talk about public revelation. Are you required by faith to believe in public revelation for your salvation? Yes, you are. We all are. What is the public revelation? It's God himself revealing himself through a series of covenants and the sacred family bonds throughout salvation history, starting with Adam, all the way to Christ for the salvation of humanity. And it is transmitted by two means, through sacred scripture and the tradition of the church, which is safeguarded by the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church. Public revelation was given to the apostles who were the first witnesses of Jesus' public life and the events of, his, events of our salvation. So they saw his life, works, death. And most poignantly, they, saw, they were witnesses to the resurrection. They saw the resurrected Jesus in his resurrected bodily form. And then they received power from on high in the Holy Spirit and were able to go out to the world to proclaim the gospel message of the good news. The public revelation was full and complete with the death of the last apostle who was St. John the Evangelist. Right, thank you. Thank you, brothers and sisters. We can be interactive with this sometimes. I'm kind of one of those interactive kind of guys. So all public revelation is finished in a sense of what is given. With, it's called the deposit of faith with the death of the last apostle with St. John the Evangelist. Sacred tradition and the living tradition is how it is transmitted and passed on with the authority of the teaching body, the magisterium. And God has revealed all that is necessary for our salvation in the public revelation. It is the fullness of revelation and nothing can be added to it. Now, I think we do have to digress just for one second and talk about what revelation is. Revelation is an unveiling. It is a disclosure. It is a disclosure of that which we might not, not otherwise known. The catechism and the church teaches us and philosophers are able, we're, we know that we're able to arrive at the conclusion and the ascent that God exists just by creation around us. We logically by reason can arrive at the conclusion that God exists and that he is good and he is beauty and that he is truth, that he is one, all of those things. We can know all about God though and not know God. That's for you and me too, brothers and sisters. We can know all about God, but not know God. And it takes revelation 
to know not just about God, but to know God in a personal way, in a way in which the Father discloses who he is. There is no way that the philosophers could know that God is pure love, that that's who he is by his very nature, and that he is three persons one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That requires revelation and love by its very essence and nature, brothers and sisters. Love must do what? Love must reveal itself. It has to give itself. And the only response that is appropriate and proper to such a revelation of love, our response, love. Love in return. Trust in the one who is revealing and love in return. So this public revelation requires the, the assent of Catholic faith or universal faith for our salvation. We must believe in real truth and the revealed truth and doctrine to be saved. Catechism number 66 says, however, although it is complete, it may not be completely explicit and it remains for the Christian faith gradually to grasp its full significance over the course of the centuries. And doesn't that make sense? We're talking about an infinite God who is revealing himself. If any of us could grasp this infinite God all in an instant and in one moment in our minds and understand the fullness and exhaust who God is, it means that there is nothing greater than our own minds. It means that God is no greater than what we could possibly conceive. I don't know about your mind, but I'll speak for my own. That would make for a very weak, fragile, flimsy, limited conception of who God is. And let us all pray that he's greater than what my mind is and our mind collectively. So the deposit of faith we can grow in our understanding of it and we can see a couple good examples of that. One such case is Mary in her Immaculate Conception. It's contained in the public revelation. It's contained in its form in Luke passage 1, 28 to 35. The angel Gabriel appears to the Blessed Virgin Mary and says, hail full of grace, or the translation is better, you who have already been fully graced. It's a perfect past participle, past tense, that basically is saying you've already been full of grace. You've been full of grace from the moment of your conception, but it took the ch church, the bride of Christ, years to ponder that message, to think about it, to unpack it, to actually digest it and receive the fuller revelation of it. Divine Mercy Sunday is another case and example <clears throat> of the same exact thing. Why is the eighth day of Easter? Why do we receive the extraordinary promise? Can't touch that topic right now. <laughs> private revelation. What is private revelation? Often formed, uh, often also referred to as popular piety. It also is divine revelation given for the benefit of the person, a group of people, or even the whole church. Authentic private revelation and popular piety is indeed inspired by the Holy Spirit. However, it is very secondary to public revelation is always at the service of the deposit of faith, always at the service of public revelation. It can never contradict, oppose, or alter the primary revelation of Jesus Christ, the public revelation. We are not required to believe any part of private revelation for our salvation, not even the approved apparition sites of those like I mentioned, Fatima, Lourdes, and Guadalupe, those great sites where incredible conversion signs and wonders have been worked for humanity. Private revelation is part of the church's charism of prophecy. <clears throat> now this is in sacred scripture and it's in tradition. Do you know prophecy is a charism of the Holy Spirit? It's a charism of the Holy Spirit. When we receive the Holy Spirit on high, we, many of us, have the gift of prophecy. Many of you have the gift of prophecy and probably don't even know it. Prophecy is a real part of the church. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to 4, make love your aim and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy 
Above all the spiritual gifts, he says, earnestly desire the gift of prophecy. He who prophesies speaks to men for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. He who prophesies edifies the church. He who prophesies edifies the church. For what purpose? For the upbuilding, encouragement, consolation, and edification of the church. St. Paul also says prop that prophecy can change lives. He points out that the impact of prophecy can have on a non-believer is, quote, the secrets of his heart are disclosed. So falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. And then he goes on to say the first Thess Thessalonians five, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophesying, but test everything. Do not despise prophesying, but test everything. And that is the standpoint and disposition of the church and its treatment of all private revelation. It has to test them. Why? Why would the church be so careful and guarded to test all private revelation? Why, brothers and sisters? Because what we have in the public revelation is so precious. Because it is the pearl of great price. Because it's the revelation of God himself who is love. And something in a treasure that is so great and so precious must be guarded, defended, protected, preserved, valued, treasured, safeguarded above all things. Because it reveals not only who God is in his fullness, but brothers and sisters, it reveals who we are and who we are called to be in God and the intimate life that we are intended to have with him forever and ever and ever. Amen? Amen. So should we guard the public revelation, sacred scripture and the tradition? Should the magisterium protect the, the public revelation that Christ has handed on to his apostles and the apostles have transmitted throughout 2,000 years? Definitively, yes, it's of great value. However, private revelation does have its role and it does have serious value. Most private revelation comes in two forms, apparitions, and there's different kinds of apparitions, can't go into all that right now. Apparitions are visually seeing an image of either Jesus, Mary, the saints. <clears throat> Locutions. Locutions are hearing an interior voice that is not our own speaking voice. You all can hear the voice of God. And most often times, this is a little digression, most often times you will actually hear it as your own voice. If you close your eyes right now, say your full name to yourself interiorly. Were you able to hear your voice? If you say your name to yourself, are you able to hear your voice? Most oftentimes when God is speaking to us, we hear in our actual own voice, but the content is not anything that we could possibly carry our own selves. But locution goes further than that. Locution is the voice of God, the voice of the Blessed Virgin, the voice of saints that is very distinct, that is separate from what our own interior voice would be. It's something that can be trusted once it's been tested. We'll talk about all the categories of testing in a minute. So what is private revelation? The catechism teaches that private revelation can guide and inspire souls to help live more fully the gospel revelation of Jesus Christ in a certain period of history. Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was head of the CDF <clears throat> and wrote the theological commentary on the message of Fatima, said that the fundamental aim is to help us to understand the signs of the times and to respond to them rightly in faith. He also said that private revelation must be discerned and scrutinized, but it ought to be taken seriously, not scorned. In other words, the church's disposition to private revelation is one of openness with caution. Ratzinger also observed that the, quote, the criterion for the truth and value of a private revelation is its orientation to Christ himself. It must orient us to Jesus himself. 
We should also understand and recognize that although private revelation cannot add or alter anything to the deposit of faith, the public revelation, it can and does contribute to greater understanding in the church's development of doctrine. It can even influence how the church worships in her liturgy, as seen by the devotion of the Sacred Heart, Corpus Christi, and to us probably most strikingly, the, mo the message and devotion of the Divine Mercy as given to St. Faustina, Divine Mercy Sunday. It just became a universal feast in the church when? 2001. Well, it was declared 2000, but 2001. So it took 2000 years for this feast to be declared and it was really highlighted by private revelation. Was it already present in scripture and the tradition? Yes. But it took the private revelation to grow and develop in the understanding of that revelation that was already present. And that's one of the roles of private revelation. Okay, so let's talk about the degrees of authority on a private revelation. And we can even talk about this in regard to Medjugorje. There are three degrees of authority. The, typically when there is an alleged private revelation, whether apparition or locution, the first level of authority is the local bishop. Second level of authority that is a greater authority would be a conference of bishops. So if an apparition took place in the United States of America, it would be the US Conference of Catholic Bishops that would evaluate its content if it went to that level beyond the local bishop. The third level of authority for an alleged apparition or private revelation is the Holy See itself, the Vatican. Do you know how many apparitions, how many private revelations have been put directly under investigation and the authority of the Vatican to investigate and review the nature of its content and its worthiness to be considered of divine origin. Do you know how many? Well, y'all know, y'all are smart. <laughs> one, one, what is it? Medjugorje. The authority was removed from the local bishop. It was, and then it went to the Episcopal Conference of the Yugoslavian bishops. This is all factual truth. The authority right now of Medjugorje lies directly under the Holy See. Any pronouncement of any previous bishop, there were two bishops of the, bishop of the, of the Diocese of Mostar in which Medjugorje lies, that's where Medjugorje is located. Two bishops gave their opinion. They gave their take on what they thought, both negative judgments on what Medjugorje is. The Holy See in 1998 through Cardinal Bertoni and the CDF when Cardinal Ratzinger was the head of the CDF made very clear that those two judgments of those two bishops were their own private personal opinions. Their personal judgment that has no bearing on the, dec the formal declaration of the church. And then the church took full authority in the Holy See. It is the only apparition in 2,000 year history of the Holy Roman Catholic Church that goes directly under the Holy See. Should that tell us something? Should we maybe pay a little bit more attention to this one in particular in, our, in its evaluation and what its content might be? And that when it seemingly was shut down, they called St. John Paul II the great defender or protector of Medjugorje. Cardinal Ratzinger also protected and defended it. I'll get into the Ruini report, looking at time. I'm gonna get into the Ruini report. <laughs> Pray, oh Lord. We need, <laughs> need to get outside of time for a minute, make it all come rushing in so we can pack it all in. So I'm just gonna leave it right there for that. So it did go from the local bishops, then to the Conference of Bishops, the Yugoslavian Conference of Bishops. They actually made a determination, and I'll tell you about, there can be three types or categories or status, the three status of an alleged private revelation. It can be declared after it's evaluated by either the bishop, the Conference of Bishops, or in this case, the Holy See, it can be determined to be of supernatural origin, that its origins are divine 
and that there's nothing contrary to faith and morals of the, private, of the public revelation that came to us through Jesus Christ and the apostles. The second one, and I'm not going to use the Latin terms on you here. You can look it up or I'll give it another in a writing or something. A declaration stating that the revelation has, stay with me here, not been determined to be of supernatural origin and not determined to not be of supernatural origin. In other words, there's not a determination one way or the other. <laughs> we're, we're not declaring that it is of supernatural origin. We're not declaring that it's not of supernatural origin. That's where Medjugorje has stood the whole entire time, quite frankly. Officially, that's where it stood the whole entire time. And with the Yugoslavian bishops, that's the conclusion that they arrived at in the 90s when Medjugorje was entrusted to them. The third category or status of a private revelation is that it is not of supernatural origin. And there has never been an official declaration on Medjugorje that it has not been of supernatural origin by, not by, not ever. It's only been personal opinion of two bishops that were their personal opinion. It was their own personal take. Are we to respect bishops? Yes, of course. Of course we respect bishops. They're the successors of the apostles. We as Marian fathers have great esteem and respect for bishops. We have great esteem and respect, of course, for all the public revelation and the deposit of faith of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. I do as a Marian. As you can tell, I probably have a personal, I, I, I give my personal assent to Medjugorje on a personal level. I'm, I'm giving you a peak preview. Can you give your personal assent and be in good standing as a Catholic? Oh, yes, you can. And, and I do. Now, if the, somehow the church made an official declaration contrary to that, if the church said Medjugorje is not of supernatural origin, you cannot have faith or devotion in it, would I give my assent to the teaching of the church? You better believe I would. And so would all my other brother Marians, many of whom received their vocations or their vocations were influenced by Our Lady Queen of Peace of Medjugorje. We would all immediately with one voice say yes, we assent to what Mother Church teaches because there's the, the, great, the pearl of great price, the public revelation that comes for our salvation through Jesus Christ. So, where does Medjugorje stand now? In 2010, Pope Benedict XVI brought a commission together because he wanted greater study. Now, now, now keep this in mind, and this gives testimony to the authority. It's under the Holy See, Medjugorje and the investigations under the Holy See. Pope Benedict XVI put a commission together of expert theologians, a medical team and scientific team to investigate and study the phenomenon of Medjugorje. And their task was to collect, quote, their task was to collect and examine all the material about Medjugorje and present a detailed report followed by a vote on the supernatural nature or not of the apparitions as the most appropriate pastoral solutions and the most appropriate pastoral solutions. They met 17 times from January 17th and well, from 2010 to January 17th, 2014. Those were results were presented to a commission called the Fiera Four, a group of theologians that were to present it to Pope Francis. At this time, now by this time, Francis was now the Pope and, and Benedict was no longer the Pope. After a couple years, Pope Francis decided not to disclose or not to make public the findings. So this report and this commission, this investigation, the report itself is called the Ruini Report. It's called the Ruini Report because Cardinal Ruini headed up the commission to investigate the messages and everything that goes into evaluating a private revelation. Pope Francis himself said that he did not want to put the Ruini report, quote, he did not want to put it up for auction. Now, admittedly, I'm not real sure what that means, but he didn't want to put it up for auction, so it was not publicized throughout the universal church. But, there, but the investigation did take place, and it did come to light through a, an important author, Andrea Tornielli, 
that writes for the stamp, but he's a prolific author. And they call him sometimes the voice of Pope Francis. He wrote for Pope Benedict. He's done writings on many of the Holy Fathers, very intelligent man. He actually wrote and released in the Prensa the findings of the Ruini investigation and what the report was. He released it publicly. You can look this up online. And what were the findings? First of all, they voted this panel of theologians, this panel of experts, voted 13 to one and one abstention. So 13 were in favor of the supernatural origin of Medjugorje, and only one was opposed. One abstained for the first week of messages, for the first week of apparitions, 13 one to one. That's pretty decided, I would say. If I'm a gambling man, I want those odds. These are highly qualified experts, right? 13 one to one. They also gave pastoral recommendations that Medjugorje was not, the, the pilgrims of Medjugorje were not receiving enough pastoral care. So that shortly thereafter, Pope Francis appointed what is called an apostolic visitor or visitator. There's different ways to say it. And that apostolic visitator was Archbishop Henrik Hoser. Father Chris, Father Seraphim, and I met him in person, and we discussed the connection between Medjugorje, the message and devotion of, of the message and devotion of the divine mercy, and the phenomenon of Medjugorje. Father Chris added in Fatima. Archbishop Hoser said to us, there is an apocalyptic connection between Fatima, Medjugorje, and he added Cabejo, and the message and, and the message and devotion of divine mercy for our times. This was in 2019, when Father Serafim Mikulenko, then the world's foremost expert on the message and devotion of divine mercy, Father Chris Aylar, who you know, and I had this private conversation and a meeting with Archbishop Hoser. It's very telling, very, very telling. So that's the Ruini report. That's where it stands. It's been kind of tabled, so to speak, but what they determine, I think, is significant. What we should know that there is something that the church teaches called the census fidelium. And I think what we see and what we'll see, and this happens with a lot of apparitions, and it happens with a lot of messages. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says that the census fidelium, that there is a collective sense of the faithful called the census fidelium, which is a felt conviction of truth on part of the whole church, clergy and laity together, guided by the magisterium. This is number 67. Guided by the magisterium of the church, the census fidelium, the sense of the faithful, knows how to discern and welcome these revelations. In these revelations, whatever constitutes an authentic call of Christ or his saints for the church. So basically what we can say is in due time, there's a sense amongst the faithful, the clergy and the laity that emerges about certain places that is called the sense of the faithful. It happened with Fatima. Now with Fatima, there were signs given. We know that there were six apparitions, right? And there was an incredible sign. Now, what would have happened? There's a, there's a misnomer that we can't actually believe in a private rev revelation or have faith in a private revelation until all the apparitions are complete and it's received official formal approval of the church. Brothers and sisters, that's just false. That's not true. You can give your personal assent, personal assent, not your assent that is assent of the church, but your own personal belief in a private revelation if you have a willing disposition to be obedient to whatever the church declares in regard to that revelation. We all have that, right? I hope we have that. We should have that disposition. We already talked about that. So what is the criterion? Well, private revelation, um, as I mentioned already, is the Holy Spirit highlighting and animating a particular dimension of the gospel for a particular time and purpose. We talk about Fatima and, and Medjugorje, or Fatima and, and Lourdes. Pope Francis talked about private revelation, specifically Lourdes and Fatima. He said, they have their precise place in the development of the life of the church in the last century. They show, among other things, that revelation, still unique, concluded, and therefore unsurpassable, 
is not yet de a dead thing, but something alive and vital. It's alive and vital. Now, with Fatima, had we waited until the church approved for the apparition of Fatima to be approved by the church officially, we would have waited 13 years. 12 years. Let me fix my math. 12 years. It wasn't approved until 1929. That means that nobody would have showed up for the sixth apparition. Nobody would have seen the solar miracle and the phenomenon of the sun spinning if they all would have said, I can't go to this, I can't go and show up. Even though the Blessed Virgin said she's going to come, I can't go because it's not yet been approved by the church. That doesn't make any sense. 70,000 people, believers and non-believers alike, saw the solar miracle spin just like I described me seeing in Medjugorje. They saw it spin, pulsate, move, and then plummet to the earth and dry all the ground around and all the wet clothes of the people who were there. An incredible spectacle. 70,000 plus people witnessed it at the same time. There are signs and wonders that have taken place in Medjugorje that are very like brothers and sisters. Maybe not 70,000 people one time, but uh, more than 70,000 people have seen the solar miracle and other signs and healings and everything else that takes place there. So that leads into the very next thing. What is the criterion for the church's evaluation of a private revelation? Three things. First, it's going to look at the content of the messages. Does the content conflict in any way with the public revelation that is given to us in Jesus Christ. He is the word. He's the one who reveals and passed on to the apostles, safeguarded by the magisterium of the church. Is there any conflict in the messages? Now, there can be and have been with authentic revelation, private revelation in the past, some errors that can make their way in by human errors whether it be the visionary or translation or interpretation, there can be minor errors. But are there any major errors that are contrary to what the faith actually is in the deposit of faith? That's the first criterion for evaluation. 13 one to one, they voted no. 13 one to one, it's pretty substantial. The second criterion that are gonna, the one is going to look at is the nature and phenomenon of the visionary and what's taking place with the visionary. So it's going to look at things like, um, well, we'll talk about Medjugorje. Medjugorje is the most tested, scientifically and med medically tested apparition site in the history of the church ever. There have been no less than four separate medical scientific teams that have gone in to evaluate six visionaries, or two on the, the last occasion. I don't know about you all, but I don't know if you've had four different teams of medical and psychological and theological teams evaluate you for your sanity, for the content of what you say, for how you live, and for what a phenomenon might be in your life. I don't know about you, but that, might, that just sounds a little overwhelming. I'm a new priest and religious, and sometimes I feel overwhelmed and, and a sense of responsibility that it's a lot. I've seen and spent some time with at least two, if not three, four of a couple of these visionaries, and I'm telling you, I would not want their life. It's not a life that I, because you, your life is not your own. Life is not your own if you're a priest either, right? <laughs> We're called to lay down our lives for others. Why? Because there's a greater life that we can begin to live here. So anyway, the phenomenon. What takes place during an apparition? So four different medical scientific examinations. Do you know that they had 1,000-watt light bulbs flash directly during an apparition? A 1,000-watt light bulb right into their eyes. They remain dilated at the same time, only during the time of the apparition. From the time the apparition starts to the time that it ends, eyes remain in the same dilation. All the visionaries, when they were together, looked at a fixed spot and point to, they say, one-fifth of an inch to the same exact location when looking at them. They were blasted during the, during the apparition, 90 decibels of sound into their ears without moving. 90, 90 decibels? That's a lot louder than any rock concert, I think. A lot, of, a lot of places would be shut down for operating at 90 decibels. 
They're impervious to pain when they're pricked with pain or anything else of the sort. They don't feel pain. They're absolutely in a state of ecstasy. And it's been determined as well that they're not in any type of hallucinogenic influence, nor are, if you look at, just go on YouTube, uh, uh, an apparition of Miriana, one of the visionaries, and watch what takes place with her, or what, what has taken place with her in apparitions and her response. If you can fabricate that, and the number of days that it's been, so some of these visionaries have had an apparition every single day since 1981. Brothers and sisters, that's over 15,500 apparitions if they just had one a day. Try to fabricate that amongst six people. <laughs> Do you remember during the Nixon reviews when there was collaboration and they tried to keep everything together in the, in the close confidence of President Nixon um, and, and Watergate and everything that took place in Watergate and what they fabricated. And there were, these, these are professional men, smart, intelligent, very intelligent men. They didn't make it two weeks. They didn't make it two or three weeks with their story. We're talking about six kids, starting out kids, 10 to 17 years of age, threatened by communistic authority under every psychological battery and test that you could possibly imagine, never recant and never renege. Their lives are not their own. They go through terrible suffering. The demands on them, and I've seen it from, vision, from pilgrims that are coming, wanting to know more, asking the same question. Could you imagine the same question 15,500 times? <laughs> and they still answer with charity, which is the other thing of the phenomenon. What the Ruina report saw, and also what these four teams of medical, theological, and scientific experts determined, was that the visionaries grew in virtue and holiness. That's another one of the marks of whether or not an apparition, an alleged apparition, could be authentic. Did they grow in virtue? Did they grow in holiness? Now, it's not only contingent on that. It's not, there have been apparition sites, actually, as Father Leon Pereira, who is the uh, the English-speaking chaplain in Medjugorje, a friend of mine, a really good guy, he says, visionaries can still go to hell. They have to work out their salvation just like you and I do in the real world. But the church in its evaluation will look at authentic revelation to see if they've grown in virtue and what qualities are there. Are they growing in holiness? And typically across the board, that is the case. La Salette would be one example where visionaries kind of went a little bit off the rail. I won't go into all of that, but it gives testimony that they don't have to be perfectly holy. The third category and probably the most important is the spiritual fruit that is produced by private revelation. What takes place in the lives of the seers or the hearers and also with those who are devotees or those who are coming and looking at the revelations themselves. And here, brothers and sisters, is where I believe it is just undeniable for me for Medjugorje. I am standing here today as a priest of the Roman Catholic Church, as a consecrated religious solely because of Our Lady of Medjugorje. That is the fruit that, I am just one of the fruit. Many of, as I mentioned, many of my Marian brothers, their vocations came because of Medjugorje or their vocations were encouraged because of Medjugorje. In my own personal family, and I'll talk about this just briefly, we underwent conversion. I was living far from God, doing all the things in the ways of the world, the parties, the chasing after everything, and so, so empty, so empty. And I was given a book by somebody I did not want to receive the book from, my own father, who I had been estranged from for a year and a half. And he came and gave me this book after not speaking for a year and a half. He gave it to my brother and me and said, you got to read this book. It's talking about the Blessed Virgin Mary appearing in Yugoslavia. Couldn't even pronounce the country or the name at the time. I couldn't pronounce it. I'm like, oh my goodness, he's crazy. And would I have wanted to receive it from anybody else but him, right? <laughs> my father who had been absent when I was growing up, 
who wasn't there for a year and a half, comes talking to me about God. He called me, he gave me the book, I chucked it in the corner, he called me after about a month and said, son, have you read the book yet? I said, no, dad, I didn't read the book yet. He said, well, why not, son? I said, well, dad, I, I didn't read the book because I just don't buy any of that Mary stuff. <laughs> Mary stuff. This, he said, I tell you what, why don't you give me a call back and tell me why you don't buy any of that Mary stuff? So, like a non, good non-believer and one who was probably carrying some wounds and resentment in my heart, I set out to read that book to prove my dad wrong. The book's called Medjugorje, The Message by Wayne Weibel. It actually captures the spirit of Medjugorje. I read that, I started to read that book. I'm gonna prove him wrong. I'm gonna knock him off his high horse, off his soapbox. I'm gonna show dad that he's wrong. I get into chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. Oh my goodness, the scales fall. God is real. And that is a phenomenon of Medjugorje, brothers and sisters. It makes God alive, real, and present in our world today, not just 2,000 years ago. A living God, that is the experience that many people have. I went to the local Catholic church, I had to find out more of what was going on. They weren't talking about Medjugorje there. The priests weren't talking about it there. There weren't any pamphlets. No pamphlets on Medjugorje. Mom was the word, but I had to pack up my stuff and go see my dad in North Carolina, and we started to pray the rosary. And we started to live the messages of Medjugorje. We prayed the rosary, we fasted, we prayed. We started going to Mass. A whole lot of other things happened. <laughs> we changed our lives. Our lives changed. Within about three months, we stopped a party lifestyle that we were living. My parents were divorced for 15 years. My dad had been married to another woman. This all was just a little bit too much for her. My mom was living in Ohio. This woman, a good woman, was living with my dad, my brother, and me. They were married civilly. It was too much for her, she left. My mom moved closer to North Carolina with a job that she had. And a long story short, for the sake of time, because I know I'm running up against it, mom moved to the same town of Wilmington, North Carolina, where my dad, my brother, and I were, and they started hanging out. <laughs> Again, <laughs> having coffee together and doing things like going to mass and praying the rosary and fasting and praying for their two sons. And then I got the call one day, the proverbial call from dad, another call from dad. Hey son, <laughs> I think that's how you did this, the hey son call. Hey son, what are you doing? I'm studying for final exams, dad, what are you doing? Uh, I, well, your mother and I would like to come over and see you, could you put some coffee on? Now, you know it's serious when, when the coffee has to go on. It's serious stuff. So I put out like, oh, Lord, this is serious. What's coming now? Oh, I hope it's not that. Please don't let it be what I think it is. The coffee goes on. Dad comes in. You know, son, you know, thank you. We're having coffee, small, chat, small talk, chat, chat. You know, son, your mother and I, you know, we have a sacramental marriage. <laughs> We were married and our marriage was blessed in the church before and we really think we're supposed to be together. Woo, boy. <laughs> red flags going off in my mind, red flags. But I said, okay, dad, all right, fine. I see what's going on in your lives, so be it. But this is the last wedding I'm going to for either one of you two. <laughs> no more. That was in 19... 94, 94, 95. But our conversion started in 1993. My parents have been married and are together to this day. Medjugorje brought my family back together. It brought a conversion to my brother. It brought me to religious life, to consecrated life, and it brought me to holy priesthood. Have I tested and evaluated if my beliefs are solid and true or not in Medjugorje? Honestly, I have. I was raised and reared anti-Catholic actually in my childhood. My childhood experience 
In my Protestant childhood, I encountered Jesus Christ truly and authentically, and I loved him, and I believed in him. But I was taught that Catholics worship the Blessed Virgin Mary. So even after my experience of Medjugorje and this whole thing that initially took place, I had to work through all the theological prejudices that were within me, and I thank God that I had to do that. I had to actually ask the question, who is Mary? What is her role in the world? And what should her role be in my life? And now I understand. She's the mother of God. She was given to us from the foot of the cross. She's the one who gives her fiat. It always says, be it done unto me according to thy word. She's the one who says, do whatever he tells you to do. She's the one who is in Revelation 11 and 12 and 13, who is the woman that the, that the dragon goes to make war with. She's the one who comes to the world with a mother's heart and says, children, trust my son. Trust in my son. He has the words of eternal life. Children, be converted. Be converted, children. Believe in the gospel. That is the message of Medjugorje. Medjugorje can be su summed up, and this is what takes place on a daily basis. Every single day, if you go to Medjugorje in the evening, they pray all three of what were the original mysteries, so joyful, sorrowful, glorious mysteries of the rosary. On Thursdays, they pray uh, the luminous mysteries that were given by John Paul II. Confessions are heard as well. Medjugorje is referred to as the confessional of the world. Cardinal Schönborn has referred, the, the, the Cardinal and Archbishop of Austria has referred to Medjugorje as the superpower of mercy. The superpower of mercy. Many pilgrims who go describe it as the edge of heaven because peace radiates and emanates from there. The peace is incredible. Jesus said to St. Faustina, in Diary Passage 300, mankind will not have peace until it turns with trust to my mercy. The message and devotion of the divine mercy, and I do believe the private revelation of Medjugorje, my own personal expression here. I can express my own personal belief as you can express your own personal belief with the intention always to be faithful to the church and obedient to the church. The message and devotion of divine mercy and Medjugorje, our lady queen of peace, our lady queen of the divine mercy go together for our own period of time. I'm convicted of it, brothers and sisters. Heaven is speaking to us, asking us to be converted, and we're in urgent times right now. The apostolic nuncio, Father Chris Alar and I were in Medjugorje at the end of 2019 before the pandemic. It was the solemnity of Mary, mother of God, I was a brother in the sacristy because that's the only spot I could get in because St. James Church was packed out. Father Chris was with 116 other priests and Archbishop Pizzuto, the apostolic visit, the, no, not the apostolic visitator, Cardinal, Archbishop Hoser was celebrating the mass. He was the apostolic visitator. The apostolic nuncio to Bosnia Herzegovina where Medjugorje is at is Archbishop Pizzuto. In his homily, Archbishop Pizzuto said, we stand in this sanctuary of the Queen of Peace. Woo! We stand in this sanctuary of the Queen of Peace, right on cue at 12 o'clock, right? And he said, is she not the Queen of Peace because she's the Queen and Mother of Divine Mercy? Is she not the Queen of Peace because she's the Queen and Mother of Divine Mercy? Did John Paul not consecrate the whole third millennium to the divine mercy? Was the prayer that he prayed in 2003 that we open up to and we'll pray it again? His prayer, queen of peace, pray for us, mother of mercy and of hope, obtain for the men and women of the third millennium the precious gift of peace. Peace in hearts and in families and communities and among peoples. Brothers and sisters, we need peace. We need peace. Pope Benedict said that the mission of Fatima is not over. It is still active. John Paul II is believed to have said that Medjugorje is the continuation of Fatima. The visionary Miriana 
said that the Blessed Mother said to her, what I began at Fatima, I will complete here in Medjugorje. Brothers and sisters, we're gonna move into this time of prayer and do what Our Lady asks us to do. First of all, we always take up the five stones, what they do in Medjugorje as well. The message summed in five points. What do we do? We pray from the heart, especially the rosary. Two, frequent reception of Holy Communion and going to Mass. They do it twice a day oftentimes in Medjugorje, two Masses a day. Three, uh, read Holy Sacred Scripture on a daily basis. Four, go to confession and five, fast. Though that's the core of the message of Medjugorje. Brothers and sisters, if you do those things, whether you believe that the messages are of divine origin or not, guess what's probably gonna happen? You're probably gonna be what, converted? You're gonna experience peace, and most likely you're going to heaven. <laughs> it's a pretty good bet. I'm gonna read one last message to you from Medjugorje. This was given to Maria on October 25th, just this past October. I'm reading this particular, oh, let me just, I'm gonna go into that. Give me one more minute, Brother Alex. We're gonna go into the devotions in a minute, but indulge me just for one more, one more second. Father Leon has also said, Pereira, the English speaking chaplain, I, I love this, we're doing those five stones. So, so when we're praying from the heart and praying rosary, when we're, uh, when we're reading scripture, when we're going to confession, when we're receiving Holy Eucharist, when we're fasting, when we're doing those things, we are undergoing conversion. Now, some would say, well, what if it's a deception? What if, what if it's of an evil one? What if it's a grand deception that's taking place in Medjugorje is all one deception? Well, well, brothers and sisters, praise be Jesus Christ. Because we're all being deceived and going to mass often. <laughs> Praying the rosary every day and all three sets of the mysteries, if not four. Praying from our hearts. Receiving ho Holy Eucharist, if not once, twice a day in Medjugorje. Going to confession and fasting. If we're deceived, oh, happy deception. <laughs> what a glorious, salvific deception. Let me be deceived more. <laughs> if it's authentic and of the real thing, then let us embrace it. And let us embrace it all the more, brothers and sisters. The message that was given on October 25th. Dear children, winds of evil, hatred, and peacelessness are blowing through the earth to destroy lives. That is why the Most High sent me to you, to lead you towards the way of peace and unity with God and people. You little children are my extended hands. Fast and offer sacrifices for peace, the treasure for which every heart yearns. Thank you for having responded to my call. And I would say that that echoes back to that very first day of messages, that I, the second day of messages that I told you about, the message that was given from the Blessed Virgin on June 26. I wish to be with you to convert and to reconcile the world. And then to Maria separately, peace, peace, peace. Be reconciled, only peace. Make peace with God and among yourselves. For that, it is necessary to believe to pray, to fast, and go to confession. Brothers and sisters, we're, we've been doing that here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy for the past two years on the first Friday and Saturday devotions. This month actually marks the 24th month. Father Chris, at the prompting of Father Kaz, Father Chris and me and Brother Ken, Brother Mark, Brother Alex, all the whole, all the Marians took on this call, this task to do the first Saturday, first Friday and first Saturday devotions. Father Chris and I were able to do the first four together in 2021. We're going to do exactly, and this is what Our Lady is asking in Medjugorje, it's the same exact things that we're doing on the first Saturdays. So we're gonna come and expose our Eucharistic Lord. We're gonna love him, adore him. We're gonna do a spiritual communion. We're gonna pray five decades of the rosary. We're gonna meditate for 15 minutes on the mysteries of the rosary. I haven't decided if they're gonna be joyful or glorious yet. Pray on that. And then we're gonna do an act of consecration to Our Lady as well. When you do this for the first five Saturdays as Our Lady has promised in Fatima, 
She promises that we will receive the graces needed for salvation at the moment of death. This comes from Fatima, an approved apparition, fully approved by the church. You can put full stock in it and your own. Still, it's still your own personal belief though. It's still your own assent to the faith. So let us prepare our hearts to enter into prayer in the heart of our Lord Jesus and ask Our Lady, Queen of Peace and Queen of the Divine Mercy to lead and guide us. Amen. Amen.
Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for being here with us truly. Hidden under the veil of bread, yet in your fullness. You who are king. You who make yourself so small for us, so little and so humble. We praise you, we glorify you, we honor you, we give you all thanks, Lord Jesus. We come to worship you and to make reparation against the offenses to your mother's heart. Mother Mary, we love you. We thank you for embracing us, your children. We thank you for embracing humanity and coming to us over and over and over as any good mother would do, but you're not just any good mother. You are the great mother, the great mother of God and our mother. Thank you, Mama. Thank you for appearing in Fatima. Thank you for showing us the wonders of heaven. And thank you for calling us to your son. We offer all of these devotions, all of these prayers, we offer our hearts to you. And we pray these prayers from the heart, Mother. We pray as your children from the heart. We pray that peace reign in the world. We pray that you unleash a new wave of divine mercy over the whole face of the world. We pray for the triumph of your beautiful, immaculate heart. We pray that mankind might know you, might know you as truly the new Eve, the mother of all the living. And we pray that it, all of humanity might know your son, Jesus, the divine mercy. Let us begin our prayer of the Holy Rosary in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, in a life everlasting, amen. amen. For the Holy Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For an increase in the virtues of faith, hope, and love. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, the world without end. Amen. 
the first glorious mystery is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. The second glorious mystery, the ascension of our Lord Jesus into heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. The third glorious mystery, the descent of the Holy Spirit. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those who most need of thy mercy. The fourth glorious mystery is the assumption of our blessed mother into heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. The fifth glorious mystery is the coronation of Our Lady, Queen of heaven and earth. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, <laughs> as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O most holy Mother of God. Let us pray. O God, whose only begotten Son, by his life, death, and resurrection, has purchased for us the rewards of eternal life, grant we beseech thee that while meditating upon these mysteries of the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking to ruin our souls. Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us, and may the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we have completed, brothers and sisters, one of the four components that Our Lady asks on, first, on the first Saturday devotions. That is five decades of the rosary, prayer from the heart. She also asks for confession and that we receive Holy Communion and meditate for 15 minutes upon one set of the mysteries. In order to prepare ourselves, we, I encourage you, if at all possible, go to confession. If you can go to confession, if you've been within the last two weeks, or if you can go shortly thereafter, I really encourage you to go to confession in person. If you're not able to do that, I'm gonna lead you now in a little bit of an examination of conscience. And if we can make a spiritual act of contrition, we'll do that together actually afterwards. But for the meantime, let us just examine ourselves. Lord Jesus, we come before you. You are the Prince of Peace and you are mercy in and of itself. And in your mercy, we experience freedom. The freedom of the sons and daughters of God. We ask you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to illuminate in our conscience anything for which we need to repent of. We ask that you bring to mind areas in our lives where we've been selfish and self-centered and self-serving. Lord Jesus, we ask you to bring to our mind and consciousness areas where we've neglected love for you, where we may have dishonored you, or even blasphemed you, and we ask your mercy upon us and forgiveness if we've offended you or the Father, the Holy Spirit, or grieved the Holy Spirit in any way, shape, or form. Bring to consciousness any such times in our lives that are unconfessed.
We ask you to illumine the times we've been judgmental of our neighbors, of our brothers, of our sisters, where we've judged them, in our, whether in heart or outwardly, where we may have gossiped, where we might be impatient. We ask you to bring to mind any areas in our life where we've been impure, where we haven't acted in purity of heart for you, where our intentions have been mixed. Lord, we ask you to highlight any areas in our lives where, we, where you want us to grow. We ask that you remove any obstacles from us from this growth. In your holy, precious name, we come against any barriers, walls, obstacles, and we order you in the name of Jesus to come down. And we welcome you into our hearts, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we ask that you show us in any areas in our life where there is unforgiveness of our brothers and sisters, of our neighbors, of those who are about us. Lord, we thank you for your loving mercy for us. We thank you that you only want us to be closer to the Father. We thank you that you have brought us into the sanctuary, the bosom of his love in your person. We ask that you embed us in your sacred heart through your precious side. And we ask that your blood and water wash over us as we reside in your side. Cleanse us, purify us, make us whole, sanctify us. And now together we pray an act of contrition. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins because of thy just punishments but most of all because they offend thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to sin no more, to avoid the near occasion of sin. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, let us make an act of spiritual communion and thanksgiving. If you know the words, you can pray along. If you don't, just say them with me in your heart. My dearest Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my hearts. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, we have prayed five decades of the Holy Rosary. We've made our act of contrition, acknowledged our sins. We've received Jesus spiritually in Holy Communion and a spiritual communion. I encourage you to go to actual communion if you've not been already today. And now we will pray on the mysteries of the Rosary. And I feel as we're moving into Advent that we should pray on the five mysteries, the five joyful mysteries of the rosary. I'll lead the meditation in the mysteries. The first mystery is the Annunciation. We know that our Lord came as the Messiah, the desire to save us and to save the world. In this mystery, we ponder the wonder, the grandeur of the word becoming flesh. 
God who is without limit, God who is without end, God who holds all the cosmos into existence and brought them forth, comes to us, making himself so tiny and small, taking flesh in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, taking human nature into his divine person, Two natures, divine and human, united in the divine person of the second person of the Trinity. We thank you, Jesus. With what anticipation your heart, O Mother, was full. How you long for the Messiah. The mystics in private revelation have seen and told us that you longed for the coming of the Messiah, that you were raised within the temple, that you were consecrated in the temple as a young girl, and your deepest desire was only to serve the mother of the coming of the Messiah. Your desire was to be the handmaid of the mother of the Messiah. St. Augustine said, that Jesus was conceived in your heart before he was conceived in your womb. Oh, Mother, thank you for your heart. Thank you for your precious, tender heart. Thank you for your heart that longs and desires for your son from the moment of your conception. Thank you for your yes and your fiat. Thank you for being the gate for the Savior coming into the world. Thank you for being the new Eve. Thank you for being the new mother of all the living. In the second mystery, the second joyful mystery, we contemplate the visitation. The Blessed Virgin goes to see her cousin Elizabeth. They both are with child. In the womb of Elizabeth is John the Baptist, the forerunner who would prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the way of the Lord. You go in haste, as Holy Scripture says. You go in haste. You had to go and see your cousin. You you wanted to be her servant. He wanted to console her and assist her in her older age. In that journey, in that trek, in that pilgrimage to visit Elizabeth, truly we had the first Eucharistic procession. You took our Lord Jesus within you You who are the Ark of the Covenant, you who are the traveling tabernacle, foreshadowed by the tabernacle in the desert. You who are the fulfillment of the true tabernacle, God within you. Thank you, Mother. Thank you for that very first Eucharistic procession. At the sound of your voice and the greeting, John the Baptist leapt in the womb. And he was completely filled with the Holy Spirit and Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. He was sanctified. As church fathers and church teaching have said throughout history, John the Baptist sanctified through the womb. He leapt in the womb of the ark. He leapt in the womb before the Ark of the Covenant as David leapt before the Ark of the Covenant as it traveled throughout the desert, as it traveled to the temple where it would reside in the Holy of Holies. Mother, may we respond with the same leap. May we leap and dance with joy, with gratitude, with love before you, you who bring us Jesus, 
you who brought Jesus into the world. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Mother. Thank you for being our mother. In the third joyful mystery, we contemplate the birth of Emmanuel, God amongst us. God born into the world. What marvel. God and a baby. The moans of a child. <laughs> Holy Spirit, anoint that child, fill that child with the Holy Spirit, and consecrate that child from this day forward forever into your providence, into your holy will. <laughs> For those of you watching at home, this is not a prompt. <laughs> it's a divine prompting. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. May we all be childlike. We pray that we might have childlike hearts. We pray that you envelop us in your arms, Mother. We pray that you hold us dear to you and dear to your heart as you held your own son. <laughs> In contemplating the birth of our Lord, we pray for all mothers also who are pregnant. Pray for protection for them. Pray for protection and anointing upon their babies in utero. Pray that our children in utero be protected, appreciated, loved, honored. We pray that their mothers be honored and appreciated. Mother, we ask that you intercede for them. In the fourth joyful mystery, Jesus is presented in the temple. Simeon, who longed to see the Messiah, the Savior, is presented with the child Jesus. And he speaks prophecy. He speaks a prophetic word to Mary. <clears throat> Behold, this son is destined for the rise and the fall of many nations. And a sword too shall pierce your heart, Mary. We thank you, Mother, how you suffered for us with your son as the new Eve for the salvation of the world. We truly desire to make reparation to your immaculate heart. We come with thanks and gratitude and appreciation. We desire to mend the wounds of your heart. Oh, how a mother appreciates any gesture of love, appreciation, gratitude for them from their children. Mother, we're thankful. We're thankful for giving us the Savior, for giving us our Lord and our God 
for making. Truly, you were the one who made straight the way of the Lord. We pray that we might recognize you in all the times that you intercede for the world. We might recognize you as a figure like John the Baptist who always prepares the way to Jesus. We embrace you, Mother. We thank you and we love you. In the fifth joyful mystery, we contemplate the finding of Jesus in the temple. Lord Jesus, may we find you anew in the temple of our own hearts. May we see and find you anew. Come and dwell and live more fully in our hearts, Jesus. We pray as I'm about to give benediction that you give a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit, graces that we don't even know to ask for amongst all those who are present at the National Shrine and also those who are watching at home on the live stream. We pray for an out, holy outpouring of grace we pray for deep conversion in hearts, Lord, all of our hearts. All of us are in need of deeper, greater conversion and sanctification. We most especially pray for those who do not know you as love. As a final prayer, we pray an act of reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. O Most Holy Virgin, our Mother, we listen with grief to the complaints of your Immaculate Heart surrounded with the thorns placed therein at every moment by the blasphemies and ingratitude of ungrateful humanity. We are moved by the ardent desire of loving you as our Mother and of promising a true devotion to your Immaculate Heart. We therefore kneel before you to manifest the sorrow we feel for the grievances that people cause you and to atone for our prayers and by our prayers and sacrifices for the offenses with which they, return your, which they return your love. Obtain for them and for us the pardon for so many sins. Hasten the conversion of sinners so that they may love Jesus Christ and cease to offend the Lord, already so much offended. Turn your eyes of mercy toward us that we may love God with all our heart on earth and enjoy him forever in heaven. Amen. Amen. Let us receive the benediction of the Lord God himself with gratitude and love.
You have given them bread from heaven. Having all sweetness within it. Let us pray. Lord our God, in this great sacrament, we come into the presence of Jesus Christ, your Son, born of the Virgin Mary and crucified for our salvation. May we who declare our faith in this fountain of love and mercy drink from it the water of everlasting life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The divine praises, blessed be God, blessed be his holy name, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man, blessed be the name of Jesus, blessed be his most sacred heart, blessed be his most precious blood, blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar, blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy, Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, virgin and mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God and his angels and in his saints. May the heart of Jesus in the most blessed sacrament be praised, adored and loved with grateful affection at every moment in all the tabernacles of the world, even until the end of time. So brothers and sisters, we will continue with our normal shrine devotions right now. So we have confessions that will be going on. The confessional over here is at least is open. Thank you for your patience. I know we went just a little over today, but thank you for your indulgence and your patience in joining us in a live stream and here in, in person at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. May your day be blessed and you be filled with every grace Thank you for two full years now of First Friday and First Saturday devotions in reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. God bless you all. Father Chris Alar here to tell you that the Marian Fathers now have podcasts. Visit thedivinemercy.org slash podcasts and you'll find exciting new content featuring the Marians that you know well, such as Father Joe Roche with St. Faustina's Diary in a Year, 
homilies from the National Shrine with Father Kaz, myself, and others, and even my own Explaining the Faith series that we do every Saturday. We also have our brand new show, Sparks of Mercy, with Chris Sparks, as well as another new show called Pearls of Divine Mercy with Dr. Brian Thatcher. So you can find all these podcasts and more on all major podcast platforms and again on thedivinemercy.org slash podcasts. Thank you and God bless you.